Hello and welcome to Castle of Horror, the show dedicated to horror movies and awesomeness. This week we continue our summer film retrospective with the 1983 film Jaws 3, or as it was known in its first run, Jaws 3D. Bear in mind, if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of horror fans who have. So, warning, spoilers ahead. From Denver, Colorado, I'm your host, Jason Henderson, author of the upcoming Young Captain Nemo series from Fievel and Friends Macmillan Books, with me from Austin is Tony Salvaggio, tech director at Rooster Teeth Studios, lead singer and bassist of the band Deserts of Mars, and lead guitarist of the band Rise from Fire. Say hello, Tony. Howdy. Howdy. Also in Austin is Mr. Drew Edwards, editor-in-chief of HorrorMovies.net, writer for Rockabilly Online, and creator and writer of the long-running comic Halloween Man. Say hello, Drew. I am live and in 3D. Awesome. <laughs> I'm in 4D, so, you know. Oh, Futuristic. Yeah, I am. But that, that Jaws sequel from Back to the Future 2. Oh. What was that called? Yes. That was like Jaws 18 uh, or something. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah. There was a there was a gag to that. Uh, and finally, also, as always, color commentary from attorney Julia Guzman of Guzman Immigration of Denver. Say hello. I'm in the fifth dimension, so I beat all of you guys. You are like beyond that, which Italy. is known to man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, Jaws 3D, also known as Jaws 3, written with a numeral or a Roman numeral or whatever it is, is a 1983 American thriller film directed, which, Drew, you've always told us, thrillers do not exist. They are just classy horror. Right. All right. I don't even think this is that. We will get to what kind of movie this is. It's not even classy. Uh, Calling it classy is is being kind. Yeah, I don't even know. Yeah. Uh, To me, classy horror would be things like The Car and The Changeling. Uh, Directed by Joe Alvis, starring Dennis Quaid, Bess Armstrong, Leah Thompson, and Louis Gossett Jr. Academy Award winning actor, Louis Gossett Jr. It is the second sequel to Steven Spielberg's Jaws and the third installment in the Jaws franchise. The film follows the Brody children from the previous films at SeaWorld, a Florida marine park with underwater tunnels and lagoons. As the park prepares for opening, a young great white shark infiltrates the park, seemingly attacking and killing park employees. And once it's captured, they realize that there is a second, much larger shark somewhere nearby. That was the real cul- culprit. Okay. Uh, I, I can't wait to discuss this movie. We are we are discussing, you know, in this retrospective, films of the summer. We did all three of the Creature movies. We did Piranha. Now we're back in the Jaws franchise, which is a, a, always a wonderful summery place to be, at least for the last quarter of the 20th century, and now another 17 years beyond that. So Jaws 3. Let's start with Tony. We'll go Tony, Julia, Drew. And then I'll go, uh, Tony, what are your first thoughts on Jaws 3? This is not a good movie, but I was sufficiently entertained re-watching it, which I hadn't seen in forever. But even back when it was running, I mean, it was on cable like a lot when it finally hit cable. Um, I've never seen it in 3D, but you can tell the <laughs> process shots what's 3D, that's for sure. Like it's not even... Oh man, I wish I, I, I wish somebody would do a revival. I would watch this again just to see how Crazy Town looks, because you can tell. Um, I do have to give them props though for like, hey, we're gonna just throw all this in a blender. It's like part disaster movie. It's a Sea World thing. There's like a, you know, they're trying to, they're kind of go back to uh, creatures from from the Black Lagoon a little bit, where they're trying to like help the creatures. And there's romance, and there's the teen horror tropes of you know teens in uh, skin and clad teens, you know, doing naughty things that get them killed in horror movies, all of this stuff. Uh, I I like that they just threw all that, like, yeah, you know what? We can't beat the first one. We probably can't beat the second one. So here we are. This is what we're making. But uh, the nods to, uh, say, Creature from the Black Lagoon, I think were interesting in the way that they, obviously they'd seen it and they kind of did some things, which I think is cool uh, as part of this retrospective. All right, Julia, what are your thoughts? Jaws 3, have you ever seen this movie before? So I actually saw it in 3D in the theater in 1983 or whenever it was it came out as a preteen. I remember I was visiting my aunt in D.C. and she took me. I guess she was at a loss for what to do with this this preteen. 
<clears throat> although in D.C. you'd think it would be plenty, but whatever. We went to see this movie, and it really made an impression on me. I really wish that we could have watched it in 3D for this, uh, but some, for some reason we don't have that technology yet in our houses. But Because um, it was so much better in 3D. Like, I actually remember, and I've, I've thought of it many, many times over the years, the arm at the beginning, like the first guy who gets two to part and his arms just floating that stuck with me that arm just floating right in front of my face <laughs> you know it was so weird so I loved that this movie was in 3D and it was just so memorable and I really feel sad for all of the years that we didn't have 3D movies for some reason and I'm really glad that they're back because it's a lot of fun so um, I, I feel like it's not really fair to review it without the 3D because um, that just makes it so much better. And it does look so stupid when you're not watching it 3D to see what's obviously supposed to be 3D. Um, you know, it's, of course it's not, it's not a, 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 great, um, a great picture, as, as Adam would call it. It's, uh, you know, it's just fun, and it's, you know, the, the kids of Roy Scheider's character just kind of hanging out at, at SeaWorld, and there's some fun SeaWorld stuff. It's definitely a, a love letter to SeaWorld and all of the cute dolphins. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it has its moments, for sure. Drew, worth it for the 3D? What, what are your thoughts on Jaws 3D? Well, um, I also actually saw this movie in 3D back when it was initially out, Um or maybe it was a second run. I don't know. I saw it around the same time as I saw Friday the 13th part 3D because this was part of a a wave of 3D horror films that happened in the, the early to mid 80s. Um, it did not make the massive impression on me that uh, Friday the 13th 3D did, but... Uh, I do kind of enjoy it as a weird artifact of 80s horror. Um, it's, it's, you know, it is very enjoyably 80s. It's hokey. It is a bad movie. I mean, you can't really, like, you can say, oh, it's better in 3D. You know what? I think the true sign of a good 3D movie is how well it holds up when it's not in 3D. For example, I don't know, Creature from the Black Lagoon which we just watched. Also a 3D movie, perfectly watchable when it's not in 3D. Um, it does have its moments. I think I'm more lukewarm on it than the rest of y'all, but it's, it's fun. I don't know that I would recommend it to anybody that doesn't already like 80s horror films. Like, I don't even know that I would recommend it to somebody that loves, like, the first Jaws movie because it's just, like, a schlocky B-movie version. Like, this is, this is more comparable to, like, the shark movies that we get now than the original Jaws. It's like this weird ancestor of Sharknado. Um, yeah. So, bad movie, with, but it's it's fun to watch and kind of uh rib on i guess it's it's okay here are my thoughts and and i'm gonna sound like a fool i'm sure i i was i was discussing this with uh david bowles who's you know our beloved sometime cast member and and you know one of the smartest guys i know and i was like you know i'm gonna say good things about jaws 3 and he goes well of course you will because somehow this is in character i get that nevertheless the hate for this movie is bewildering to me i, I think this is this is not a not a horror movie. I think it's truly not a horror movie. I think ah. where does it fit in with Jaws? I think Jaws is a great film, great film. I think uh, and an, an adventure film like something out of Jack London. I think Jaws two was an exploitation slasher movie with a shark, and I think this is a straight up techie adventure movie. I think this is this is not even horror. This is adventure. Like you might have yeah, ice stations or blood in. all over the screen, Jason. I, I'm with you. I'm just saying that the way this movie is structured, everything about it basically is here are a bunch of high tech guys working a high tech job. You know, it's it's the greatest show on earth. They're keeping this park running. We spend a lot of time watching them do their jobs, and there's a big threat that's come in that they have to stop. This this has much more in common with an Alistair MacLean adventure movie or a James Bond film than it does with any kind of horror. You know, and, and I so I think it's probably it's disappointing. It's a sequel to Jaws. I agree. And so I think that's probably what's disappointing to people, is that is that all the feeling of suspense and horror has has been just sort of ripped out and replaced with what is essentially, you know, a an 80s adventure movie. 
I'm and but the thing is, I really like this eighties adventure movie. It works out great for me. You know, I, I I really love watching all these characters sort of navigate this very complicated park and, you know, see their all their goofy technology and and sort of join their world of how they're dealing with intake valves and and, and underwater, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, where you're using the blowtorch, you know, underwater what, welding and, and, and you know, arranging, you know, how things are going to go with the labor, including the people who do all those all those cleanings and also the people who do the skiing and the people who do the training of the everything. And, you know, I I actually could have watched 90 minutes of just them navigating how to keep a park this big and complicated running. I love that stuff, you know, and also there's a shark. So for me, this is fine. I, I, you know, because people call it bad and I'm like, you know, bad, what does it mean really? You know, like, is it bad compared to High School Musical 2? You know, is it bad compared to Batman Forever? You know, where, what exactly is a bad movie? Maybe I'm losing my mind, but I mean, I, I actually just sort of thought this was a this was a fine film. So let's let's <laughs> you're, you're welcome to disagree, and we're going I, to go I I can agree with you that it's got some James Bond in its DNA, but this is the most schlock horror I think of any of the Jaws <laughs> movies. There is severed body parts floating around. This is probably the most violent of the Jaws movies, for one. It's uh, it's very gory at times. Yeah. And the shark, well, this is the point in the movie, this is the point in this film series where, like, they were like, fuck it, the shark is just a, a movie monster. Like, the shark at the end of this movie is absurd. It's Sharkzilla. Yeah. Jason, yeah. Jason, baby, come on. <laughs> this, is a, this is a horror movie. Like, it, it is a horror movie. Like don't 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 take that away from this. It's the only thing it's got going for it. Yeah, well, and 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 you raise a good point. That is it. What exactly do I mean when I say, hey, I like this movie, but it, it fails as a horror film? Is it okay? You know, is does that make it? What do we do with a film that fails at being the kind of movie it is, but pretty much succeeds at being the kind of movie that nobody expects it to be? You know, or or maybe that's just me. I'm just saying I could have easily watched a whole nother movie that took place at SeaWorld in San Diego or wherever they're wherever they're supposed to be this with yet Miami. another shark. I'm down with it. I'm I'm just you know I'm fine with with watching these people navigate their lives, watching Bess Armstrong and Dennis Quaid sort of deal with their crazy labor problems and, and and all that stuff. You know, all the goofy people that work for them, Leia Thompson in a bikini, you know, and the bar that they all hang out at. It's a wonderful world. I, I would have read more books that took place here. And the dolphins are so cute. Um, I wanted to address... The dolphins are cute. See, Joya, Joya knows <laughs> wherever I speak. I, I, the, uh, I wanted to address the um, the allusions, the homage to the creature, the creature movies. Uh, again, and I feel like it is a very poor idea, and I'm sure this is actually how they do it, but I can't imagine this is a good idea. How that when they aerate, they're aer- like they're aerating his his gills so by walking him when he's unconscious, the, the baby shark. Yeah. Um, and there's this shallow pool with all these people looking on, and I'm like, they're really asking for major problems that this this shark is gonna like. I mean, I get that she didn't want that that um that uh, Bess Armstrong didn't want the baby shark in that pool because she knew that this was danger. But once the baby shark is there and then they're just like walking it around to try to keep uh, the water going through its its gills, I'm like, this is a prime opportunity for this film to have this shark wake up and like leap onto the wall and bite somebody's arm <laughs> because all these people are leaning right there. But they didn't take that opportunity. Instead, they just have the baby just flip over and die right there, which was really sad. I was like, that was actually quite unexpected. Yeah. And it was an interesting twist, given that that was such a direct homage. Well, I guess it was. I, I felt like it was an homage to the creature. There's a lot um, here that's very... Uh, cause before we go, start going through the plot, there's a heck of a lot that's similar to Revenge of the Creature. Mm-hmm. There is... I wonder how intentional that was, though, because the the... the at least the first draft of the screenplay was written by Richard Matheson, which is crazy to think about. And, yeah. you know, like, is he sitting there thinking like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to rip off revenge of the creature. Like, you know, maybe I'm giving him too much credit. I don't know. 
Like I think he absolutely would be the kind of person to do that. You know, that that yeah. that at least at least in it's because it's only it's only in certain elements, but I mean it's in a lot of certain elements. Like uh, I I think do we think that Richard Matheson had seen Revenge of the Creature? I think we'd be fools to believe that he had not seen it. You know, is is Richard Matheson above it? No, Richard Matheson is like very, very given to occasional flights of, of like winking at American pop culture. He's, you know, he shares that in common with people like, like, I don't know, I don't know, like Rod Serling will do things like that, you know, like, like be aware of, of all the entertainments that have come before, you know, whether he looked down on them or not. But um, yeah, like what, what's, what's in common here with Revenge of the Creature? You've got uh, the smart scientist woman who is very at home at the park. You've got the... A uh, hunky um, tech dude. In, the, in Revenge of the Creature, it was a hunky scientist dude. In this one, it's Dennis Quaid, and he's actually just, he's in charge of the physical plant. Well, isn't he an art. engineer? Isn't that technically what he, what he is? <clears throat> yeah. He's, he's, he basically is designing all of the habitat. He, if anything is on a rail and the rail is broken, it's his team that fixes it. If anything blows a leak and needs to be patched, it's his team that patches it. He, you know, he does. He designs everything, and he has a team that fixes everything. It's pretty cool. I mean, it, it's it's a you know, it's a neat character here. He's in love with the smart scientist girl. He has a rival, a douchebag, but nevertheless a rival who is uh, uh, this. He's hunk- pretty hot, though. Yeah. Oh, you're talking about Simon McCorkendale, mm-hmm. the late great Simon McCorkendale as Philip Fitzroy, who is a hot. Uh, you know, really cheesy sort of underwater adventurer type who makes, uh, you know, he makes documentary films and, and has and, gotten and rich I off the, of that. And am I the only one who feels like this character was a parody of Roger Moore's James Bond? I'm uh, certain that's that that's possible, part of it. But he, again, he reminded me of the the rival in the Creature movie, too. And that's Absolutely. why I don't think, I think there's a lot of homage. I wouldn't say ripoff. I don't think it's just like straight up, but there's a lot of bits. Yeah. Well, I mean, the moment they decide to move the story to a water park, I mean, like it's it's you know it's it's rife. For... This movie had a really interesting gestation because I mean, this was almost uh, a parody movie called Jaws Three People Zero, directed by Joe Dante of all people. So yeah, this is. This movie has a more, I think the gestation of this movie is one of those things where it's actually probably more interesting than the, the movie itself. Yeah, no, that's true. Uh, they're, uh, they just, Universal decided we don't want to do a parody because that would be disrespectful uh, to the legacy of Jaws. And I think that was why, for a lot of people, the terrible punchline was that the movie they made was Jaws 3D, which is with Dennis Quaid running around fighting a shark in a... Well, it was supposed to be a punchline. It was supposed to be right. a national lampoons, yeah. Yeah. Jaws three people zero. Right, but uh, right, which is what you were saying. But but the uh, yeah, they they didn't want to do that. But Universal, um, you know, they get they get Richard Matheson. In theory, this is in good hands. So well, you know, it's got a uh, really yeah. great. It's got a really great cast too. When you think about like what what a lot of the people who yeah. were in this movie went on to do. Like I mean, there are look. I was kind of ripping into it during my opening thoughts, but there are things that are that are interesting here like it, it's it's there's you know you're 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 asking the question of like bad as compared to what there are definitely a lot of movies that are worse than this like it's 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 it's, it's it, it'll it passes the time well like it it's not like a drag to watch it's it's hokey it's a hokey movie you know i think i think you know like it's definitely you know i think this is definitely a b movie as compared to even like Jaws two would probably be a B plus. I yeah. I mean, well, I don't know. I don't know about about B movie. That that that's a phrase that always confuses me the more I think about it. But the but um, what is it that makes an adventure film a bad film? Is it the earnestness of it? The fact that this is that this is such a there's something fundamentally silly. I don't know that I think of this as a, see you keep calling this an adventure film. I don't even know if I think of this as an adventure film. Like to me. The original Jaws is more of an adventure film than this because there's, like, travel involved. Like, they go out into the sea. This is so contained. Like, to me, this is a monster movie, you know, like, in, in the... It's what do almost you call like, a movie like Towering Inferno? Like, where you're in a... That's a disaster It's a disaster... Like, this is part disaster movie, if anything. I think that's fair. Yeah, I, yeah. I can see, like, calling it a disaster movie. I, I, adventure, to me, 
has to have that thing where you're like, okay, we're going, we're going off onto the, you know, it's the Indiana Jones thing, you know, the yeah, Indiana Jones adventure movie. Yeah, like it, you're, okay, you're so, traveling. So, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. Adventure is not a good word for what this is, but I think the disaster is a good word for what this is because in disaster <laughs> movies, also you always set up all the experts. <laughs> they're the guys who know what a volcano does, or they know what what uh, all the tubes in a in a big water park do, and and. You meet all them, and some are in love, and some are falling out of love, and yada yada. And then the big bad thing happens, and then they got to deal with it for the rest. Of the- that um, <laughs> I like the, your turn of phrase, though. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. definitely a disaster, is what this is. <laughs> <laughs> and you're the one that really likes this movie, which is, uh, and you, you just yeah. came up with, up with the best burn of all of us. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's disastrous. No, I, I still do really like it. I just, I find it. <laughs> That's just a funny way to put it. No, I totally, don't totally. hate this movie. I just think it's hokey. You oh, know, no, like, it like, I, and a lot of a lot of disaster movies are very hokey and very, yeah. maybe it is kind of the earnestness. But the, I, also there's this grand tradition of star studded. Like, we'll just get all these people and the draw will be like subjecting all these character actors that you love in crazy things. Right. And that's also a tradition of disaster movies. And waiting um, to see which one is going to die and which one's going to live and, yeah. and, and, and so forth. In this movie, you've got a cast that, that already is more or less stars. I mean, we have, we have Academy Award-winning actor uh, Louis Gossett Jr. And by the way, contractually, I am bound to say Academy Award-winning actor, actor every time I say the word. <laughs> uh, when you, Simon when you picture Dale, that, when you picture that, <laughs> You have to say Academy Award winner, but then you the it the Oscar should be overlaid over a picture of Enemy Mine. <laughs> I would like to thank um, the Academy for Zombies and yeah. yeah I think obligated. that Louis Gossett Jr. is having the most fun of anybody in this movie. Oh, like, absolutely. He, he's awesome in he this. Is, I mean, he's awesome. He is I like him. Chewing up the scenery and he's having a great old time. Like I, I, I think he enhances every scene he's in. Oh, absolutely. Well, and he gets to be the he gets to be the you know the 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 classic um, I, money is more important than people's lives villain. You know that that all these. Although he is have. the least he is the least dickish of all the the, the people in this role in in the in the, the Jaws franchise because like the moment he does know that there is a shark in the park he actually does try to get people out of the water he isn't like the mayor of amity in the first movie okay yes and no so yes he does for a little bit and by the way why is it that when he says hey let's shut down the park and get everybody out absolutely nothing happens except for dennis quaid running to every single attraction, <laughs> trying, like, trying to yell at people to get out, and nothing's happening. There's no announcement over the loudspeaker. There's no like employees just coming up and ushering people. Nothing happens. It's like he was talking to himself when he said that. I don't know, but anyway, um, I, I do feel like job? yeah, I do feel like he does um, have a little bit of the dickishness because when he's, uh, oh, he's talking dick. later on, he goes, he's like, oh, you know what? Don't worry about that one. Um, that whatever it was, the vent or whatever it was that stopped working, just just use the other one. They're, they're expensive, and I'm like, <laughs> maybe. Oh, he's, maybe there's a reason. He, he is a dick. He just less dickish and less irresponsible yeah. than the other characters that are in this role in the other Jaws movies. I think yeah. I think this is the trope they keep going back to. This guy is a little less cartoonish in his, despite the fact that it's such an over top, over the top character in many ways. Like he's he's a little more concerned about human life than than say the mayor of Amity, who who just was, would let serve people up to the shark if he thought it would uh, fill his his wallet. That was an amazing <laughs> character, though. When you think about how evil. How, but but unaware. I mean, the the mayor of Amity is evil because he hasn't really given it any thought, you know. But he's like actually going to city fathers and telling them to stand up and go walk into the water, you know. That was how that was how venal he was. And then later, when it's clear that that he can no longer pretend there's no sharks, he has a nervous breakdown. There's that was an amazing character. Um, okay, speaking and, uh, of the original Jaws, though, the yeah. timeline on this. Like so, so Dennis Quaid and the other fella who is not as famous 
uh, it's supposed to be the kid. Yeah, it's supposed to be the kids from Jaws. Right. Is that actually sync up correctly? Like, is this is how old those kids would be in 1983? Is that does that well, seem right? Like John Putch. Okay, so John Putch, who is uh, oddly enough the son of Gene Stapleton. Uh, so he was born in 61, so it's now 83, right? So he'd be, what is that, like 22 years old. And so he'd be the little brother in Jaws, which is 1975. So that's, you know, like eight years ago. And, um, I don't know, I mean, maybe, I mean, it's close-ish, I guess. Because actors play different role, different ages anyway. Um, and, uh, okay. yeah, and Dennis Quaid is about the same age. Dennis Quaid, uh, was born in 54, so Dennis Quaid is only one year older than the, the guy playing his little brother, all of which is fine. All of which sort of works out, you know, just just fine. Uh, I can believe it. There's every reason in the world to think that Dennis Quaid here could have been Mike, who was seen active in uh, Jaws 2 as one of the, if you recall, I, I only have a vague memory of that, even though we did the movie, we did it like a year ago or so. And he was, like, out on a boat with a bunch of, like, douchebags who, like, had their own yachts and something. I can't remember. They're, we we spent a lot of time with the teenagers in that movie. Listen, fellas, that's a way worse movie than this one, honestly. I, I, I will watch this movie again tonight. Uh, let's I, not go to that. <laughs> I am not interested in watching a movie waste all this time with Joe Mascolo, Stefano Demira of Days of Our Lives, Chase After... Chief Brody's wife, and and then it goes nowhere. Uh, I don't know. Although, I don't know. I I gotta I gotta give it for for Jaws too. I think it's more entertaining than this one. That's really funny. I I think that I think that's amazing. I yeah. No, I can't I can't share that. It's it's really funny. I mean, to each their own. They're neither one of them are great movies. Like I, I think I right. think it's sort of a tomato tomato thing. Like it, it's like you have Jaws, which is a great movie, and then you have a bunch of sequels and all. Like the only one, like I've never actually seen Jaws: The Revenge all the way through. Like I, I can't right. make it through that one. Like this, I would do it for the podcast. Like if you were to do Jaws: The Revenge for the podcast, I would, I would, I would force myself all the way through it. Um, you know, both Jaws two and three. You know, they're just they're just kind of. I think you know we we watch these movies with a degree of nostalgia nostalgia to them as well, and I think that that enhances their their value. I don't I don't know. Again, I don't know that I would show this movie to somebody if I wasn't showing it to them as some sort of weird artifact of the nineteen. Well, it's a, it's a totally totally good point. Uh, you know, and and when we look at movies, it's I mean, think about the fact that a lot of times we watch movies right at like the uh, Alamo Draft House, and it's so strange. I think that that puts us in mind. I mean, Tony, think about how how many times Tim back back when the Alamo was like one theater, and he would come out and go, "Don't talk during the movie," right? Like no matter what we're showing, even if it's even if it's the most pitiful, poor slasher film that was made straight for VHS, you know, we don't, we watch it to try to see what we can get from it. We watch it to see what it has to say about the culture, you know, uh, what have you. And but, if you talk, Ann Richards will take you out. You know, I really miss those early Alamo days when they had the person point. who was going to, who was going to take you out if you talked during the movie. <laughs> 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 that's always funny. Those are on YouTube, by the way, a lot of them. Oh, I love you know, them. So. Get your nostalgia on. Uh, <laughs> they still do a really good job, though. But yeah, I mean, yeah. I... I I it's like I've said before, man. I mean, there's some things where you watch them and you're dismayed, and maybe you poke some fun, and it's fun. You're you're hanging out in your own home, which is the only time to do that. Right. But I really do like the like. Let's watch a movie earnestly. Let's not watch it uh, ironically, especially if it's made to be ironic. This isn't to say that I don't ever watch Mystery Science Theater or Riff Tracks or whatever. That's my own thing. You can call me hypocrite if you want. But in general, a film that's made for irony's sake, I just I don't have any real. If you enjoy it, fine. But I right. not my bag by any stretch and i just wish like why don't you make something you really like yeah like, you know, so are you saying that you, you would definitely prefer that's... watching this over something like a, a sharknado which is clearly played for laughs yeah. yeah i mean i lo I love the disaster movie elements of this movie actually a, a lot like it's you know underwater towering inferno with a shark 
That's crazy. Oh, I, so, I enjoy all of that. We should we should talk a little bit about um, uh, what's going on at the beginning of this movie. Basically, in Act One, we have a great white that gets that gets uh, attracted into SeaWorld because he sees all of the uh, all of the trick uh, water skiers at the SeaWorld Orlando, and so he comes in and kind of fusses around. I don't remember if any if he even kills anybody right away because we immediately start spending all of our time just sort of setting up all the characters. Uh, we have... Well, his, the first person he kills is the guy who is trying to fix the gate. Right, but that doesn't... Right, and that happens uh, after we spend 10, 12 minutes. Yeah, it's a lot of... There's a lot of time... I, I don't want to say wasted, necessarily. Some of the time is wasted, some of the time is You can is say it. Spent. I think if you... Well, no, because I don't think all of the time is wasted because there is a lot of, just like I said, love letter to SeaWorld stuff. But there is a, there, a, not a lot happens for a very long time as far as the the horror or the action part of this film. Right, because we're we are spending time really getting off on apparently what rocket science it is to run SeaWorld, and I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying that's what this movie thinks it's about for like 15 minutes or so. Because you got Dennis Quaid doing this physical plant stuff. You got Bess Armstrong, who I love. I love Bess Armstrong. She's a she's a sitcom actress. I don't know what the hell she's been doing lately. She is, you know, I, I, maybe she's on a show now. I don't know. But I love her. I think she's funny. Uh, and she met, you totally believe her relationship with Dennis Quaid. That's all good. Uh, Leia Thompson is a this one is her of first the movie. younger. Okay. Her first, I didn't even know that. Mm-hmm. She plays one of the skiers. They've definitely set up a thing where it's like the adult so-called characters and the teen characters, even though everybody's more or less the same age. So that, like, Dennis Quaid and, and Bess Armstrong are the parental kind of adulty sort of people, and and Leia Thompson and Dennis Quaid's little brother are the, you know, goofy teenagers. Yeah. Loving it. Hey, works for me. And then uh, and then Louis Gossett Jr. is the weirdly New Orleans... Oh, I'm sorry. Academy Award-winning actor Louis Gossett Jr. <laughs> is the weirdly... New Orleans accented uh, Mr. Bouchard, who runs <laughs> who runs this place, like you guys said. Um, well, and the funny thing about, uh, you were talking about what's Bess Armstrong done lately. Actually, she did a show called Switched at Birth with Leah Thompson. No in way. The, it, Yeah, 2011 to 20, what does it say, uh, 17. So, it's, yeah, oh. still, I think. It's still going and on. No kidding. I watched that. Yeah. I know that show, actually. Well, huh. good for her. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's fabulous. All right. Um, yeah, she's she's neat. She actually was the star of a show that people dug called On Our Own way back in 1977. Uh, it was shot in New York City. It was like one of those rare sitcoms that's not shot in Burbank. So that was uh, that was cool. Um, anyway, uh, that's, that's like a long time ago. But um, okay, so we set up all of these people that work for Dennis Quaid and work for Bess Armstrong, and uh, you know, as if this could be the Enterprise, this could be the Sea View, you know, whatever it is. Except for in this case, it's a big park, and they send Shelby Overman, who is the mechanic, uh, down. You know, at the same time that Shelby, it's a guy named Shelby. At the same time that Shelby's girlfriend, who runs the bar, is hassling Dennis Quaid over whether he's like whatever, whether he's flirting with other women, Shelby's down securing the gate and gets eaten by the shark. He is the first bit of shark action, like way into this movie. It feels like it may be 20 minutes before the shark actually eats somebody. Um, so and there we start, and there's your 3D effect, actually, Julia. There's the one. Yeah, the arm, the floating arm. I was telling Jason, I'm like, I think this is an arm thing. So <laughs> 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 like, yes. Yeah, that like I said, that just really sat with me. I don't know. Um, it's, or it stuck with me, rather. Yeah, no, that was creepy as hell when the shark eats that guy. And then the shark eats... Okay, so here's the thing. There's a couple of guys in a raft in the middle of the lagoon, and this is at night. Yeah. Although, for whatever reason, Dennis Quaid and the rest of his gang are in the daylight, but whatever. They're in day for night. Yeah, They're but not really day for night. It's kind of just dusk. But anyway... Or dawn, or whatever it was. Well, dusk, I guess. Yeah. And so, uh, but anyway, the guy, the guys in the raft are in the night, in the middle of the night, <laughs> in the middle of this lagoon, 
And they're about to do so. Did you guys understand like what they're about to do that's illegal? Like they they obviously had some plan to do something illegal. Like they were the, are they getting lobsters out of a trap or something that they weren't supposed to be or crabs maybe? Through Tony, hello. Um, man, oh. now I can't remember. <laughs> I, let me I tell think, you. I think they're getting. I think they've they've tra- set a trap for crabs and they're not allowed to do that in the park. Okay, That's my guess. online it says that they are looking for coral, coral? Uh, but I didn't well, that get anything in the dialogue to that effect. Nothing. Yeah, that was unclear. So, but they're up to no good. They're it's, like they're dressed the, like the they're like is they're where they're not supposed to be. Therefore, they yeah. must die. Right. Right. But anyway, so they're there in this in, inflatable raft, uh, like you know, like an inner tube style raft, and um, they get eaten by the shark, and nothing ever comes of it. Nothing comes of it. <laughs> nobody knows. These like two guys. Nobody comes looking for them. Nobody finds their bones. Nobody finds the raft, you know, been eaten. Nothing. Uh, uh, they just well, they okay, were completely lost okay. to the movie. This is one of the yeah. reasons why I think of this as the most like a monster movie than even any of the other Jaws movies is because there is so much. Of, like, the shark just decides to eat the raft. <laughs> yeah, why? yeah, for no reason. Why? Just to get rid of the why I think he's just trying to get rid of the evidence. Yes. It's yeah, well, that's the thing. Like, it's like the shark thinks, oh, well, I better cover this up, you know. Yeah. Better, better, <laughs> I'm, I'm too slick for these Sea World people. I'm Maybe he didn't mean like to eat the raft. Maybe he was just trying to make sure there weren't more people up I, there. I, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, this really, this is a point that does not deserve us spending any time discussing it. However, I will point out that there is some precedent for this in the Jaws universe because back in Jaws one, there were like all kinds of things that uh, Roy, uh, that uh, uh, Cooper, Hooper, sorry, that Hooper was pulling out of the belly of one of the sharks that they captured. Do you remember there were like license plates and cans and stuff and, and things like that? Uh, and so it's not surprising to me that you would eat the raft, especially well, if the well, raft shark, had blood sharks on Sharks in this universe do things that sharks do not do in real life. Right. But covering <laughs> covering up its tracks is is I think it's just is, lucky. I think that's I think that's all it is. I think it's yeah, it, I think it's like, well, like, are there more people up there? Plays like this. It plays yeah. like it's covering up its own tracks. Like every time I I I watch this movie, which I've seen this movie for a movie I don't even like that much, I've seen this movie like an ungodly number of times. So I've seen this movie <laughs> more than, than movies I like better than this movie. Yeah. And for some reason I somehow manage to watch this movie a lot. So every time I watch this movie, I'm like, the shark is covering up his track. This is a, you know, this is a supernatural shark on some level. It's really strange. Yeah. Also, well, you know, I mean, there's at least the woman who comes up. She's, there. What, well, well there, and to say that no one's upset or nobody goes looking, um, yeah. you know, the next, it's like the next day when woman's like looking like, hey, have you seen him? I can't believe this is happening. Like. About that guy, but not the other two guys. Yeah. That's Shelby. Shelby gets, they do, they do go looking for him. That's how they find the shark. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yep. Yeah. I guess, again, well, yeah, huh. Yeah, you're right. They're just like, well, screw those two guys then. (laughs) (laughs) They shouldn't have been taking coral. I think it's a broad point that got dropped. I think it's one of those things that it's some idea somewhere along the way that got reduced from three scenes to two scenes down to one scene down to like, like half the well, screen time, and still there it is. By the laws of of sequelitis, like they they just had to have uh, 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 um, you know some people get killed at this point in the movie. I mean, right. that, that's really they it. They have even key. had they maybe even had like a whole subplot about the people looking for these two kids. <laughs> you know. Yeah, absolutely. They could have. Uh, it you know. By the way, I was I was just thinking about how you know just think about what X. Ex- what expertise Spielberg brought to that first movie, how whenever they're like hanging out on the docks, you know, the sounds and everything and how sort of, how sort of real Amity seems. We are so far from there now. I'm not saying that this world here doesn't seem real. I'm just saying like that felt really just special and, and, you know, and unique and classic. This, like I said, I'm really, really enjoying this, but there's absolutely nothing classic about it. It's no more classic than, you know, I don't know, Tomorrow Never Dies. It, it's, it is, you know, it is completely a modern feel. Um, anyway, okay, so now Shelby's dead. So now our main characters have to sort of jump into action because, you know, since Dennis Quaid is the only adult, you know, on this park, you know, the, the missing guy's girlfriend wants to know where he is. And 
so he has to go looking for it. I love this notion, by the way, that this world is so small for these people that they literally bring their domestic problems to Dennis Quaid to solve. You know, the end. Well, they've been you know, working on this part Quaid. for a while. So so everybody's, you know, all the union people and all the guys, his like welding crew and all those. They're all they've been engineering this part for a while, and that kind of happens. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. He is the dad, uh, even more so than Bouchard. Bouchard is the boss. Dennis Quaid yeah. is clearly the dad of the universe here. Um, so, yeah. I so like now Dennis they're Quaid forward. a lot in this movie. I, I never at any point can stretch my imagination for enough enough to believe that he's from uh, New England. <laughs> Nobody seems to be from anywhere that, that has anything to do with what they say. Dennis Quaid seems to be from Texas. Uh, his so brother, brother. His yeah. brother seems to be from somewhere in the South. He's supposedly going to school in you know, the Southwest is going to school in Colorado. Good for him. Uh, nobody, you're right, absolutely right. Nobody sounds like they're in, like, in around, like, Kennebunkport. Nobody sounds like Kennedy. No, <laughs> nothing. It, it is It is totally strange. Yes, that's absolutely right. And again, Academy Award winning actor Louis Gossett Jr. <laughs> is doing the weirdest Cajun accent I have ever heard. It makes no sense to me at all. Oh, I like it. Well, you know, the, the, these characters weren't originally intended to be the brothers from the first movie. Apparently, that was something no. that was inflicted upon Matheson. <laughs> that was apparently something that no was inflicted way. upon Matheson. Oh, yeah, no, and they said that <laughs> that early on in the scripting stage, like they they made him change these characters to be uh, the, the brothers from the first movie because they had to have the tie into the Brody family. There was also apparently a whole character created for Mickey Rooney, and then Mickey Rooney didn't end up being in the movie, so I had to cut all those scenes. So I, I yeah. find myself wondering, what was the Mickey Rooney character? Like, what was yeah, Mickey I'm Rooney my added brain. to show 3D? The voice of the shark. <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> yes! That would have been amazing! Actually, cannot... the voice of the baby yeah. shark, but <laughs> yeah, two feet <laughs> long. Okay, so let's get back to the plot. This baby shark, which is like a 10-foot, you know, great white shark, and she and Beth Armstrong is super excited when they find it. And by the way, they find it because they're looking for their dead yeah. friend. And then as soon as they find it, they're like, screw the dead friend. Let's capture the shark and put it in captivity because Beth Armstrong really wants to capture it so they can have the first can I just shark mention... in captivity. The dolphins save them from the shark. The dolphins are so awesome, and the dolphins are super smart, and they're trying desperately. I was speaking for the dolphins during the movie. I was like, there is a freaking shark. Why do you guys not understand dolphin yet after all this time? We understand English, and yet you have not bothered to learn any dolphin. And here we are trying to save your lives and tell you that there is a shark, and you're just too stupid. (laughs) Yes. But they still manage to save them by by just swimming really fast, and the the humans hold on to the fins of the dolphins. But yes, so then they they figure out, they concoct a plan to capture this shark so they can have it in in captivity. And when they finally find the body of of their friend... (laughs) Yeah. Uh, rather because the head just bops up in on front of a window in one of the so what do you call it the um okay, yeah. what do you call the undersea part of the of the exhibit? I mean, there are portals in the in these tunnels, but uh, that yeah. head bopping up is a direct quotation from Steven Spielberg's draws. Yeah, well, it was gross and disgusting. Anyway, so once they find the guy, the guy's body, they realize that, or she, best Armstrong realizes that there's no way that the baby shark is the one who killed him because. The mouth is just too huge, and the shark probably has to be 30, uh, right. 35 feet long. So, so then the next part of the movie begins. Yeah, I mean, you know, we we could we don't have to go through every every point in here, but basically what it amounts to is that once they realize that there is another giant shark, that other giant shark starts to make itself much more known um, because they are amidst all of this. The main plot of you know what's going on at the park here is that they're they are opening up this big underwater exhibit that are these 40 feet under the water, all of these tunnels made of plexiglass that are, you know, so that you can, like, look at the manta rays and the sharks and the whatever are, are, are swimming around out there, you know, regular bull sharks and other stuff like that. And, and later on, that will come to be a terrifying part of the film because the big mama shark 
discharges the, the glass tunnel and breaks the glass, and so all this water is coming in the tunnel. So they have to seal off parts of the tunnel where the humans are so that they don't, I guess, I don't know exactly know why, but for whatever reason they have to do that. So all these people are trapped in this part of the tunnel. Yeah. Uh, and I thought, because I'm a little claustrophobic, so for me that was actually the scariest part yeah. was just being trapped there. But it was really scary seeing the big charging. Didn't char- you love, by it. the way, Tony, how this plays like a video game in a sense because for them to complete the mission of the movie, they have to get rid of the shark so that the guys can swim down and, and uh, weld parts of the tunnels back together so that the guys in the engineering office can pump the water out and finally you can move the people through the tunnel. And all of those things have to happen in order or none of it happens, which is great. Uh, it, it, has a, it has a wonderful, easy-to-follow logic, you know, sharks first, then welding, then pumping, then people. And, I, I, and there, that's basically the last 30 or so minutes of the movie. Uh, you know, all There's beginning several, with... Uh, you know, games that are disaster games that came from Japan. They weren't ported really well, and that's a shame. They're kind of clunky. But now I kind of want to see... There's actually one coming out where you are uh, a person on the ground trying to survive a monster attack, basically. And uh, now I kind of want a shark version of that, (laughs) because that would be awesome. But uh, yeah, Yeah, I hope that one actually gets ported. There may be some licensing issues, but I really want to play the game where you have to deal with like what it's like to have to hide. I mean, essentially Cloverfield, you know. A great idea. But with actual like Godzilla, Gamera, et cetera, Ultraman. Uh, But yeah, it it has all those hallmarks of like, you know, this mission, um, you know, to do this and then this. I I mean, it would also be super terrible to like go to the opening of this park. And (laughs) uh, oh, by the way, so warning, uh, if you haven't learned, from horror movies and disaster movies, don't go opening day. Right. Like let, let them kind of work the kinks out. Sharks, <laughs> monsters, sea, you know, sea creatures, uh, you know, meteors, whatever. Um, trains going off the rails, experimental trains, experimental buses. Just you know, I mean, if you're a thrill seeker, by all means, go the first day. It's gonna be great. Probably the roller coasters won't fly off. Um, you know, they've tested all of that, but. If you apply this logic, the rest of us maybe we wait like a couple of days. Yeah, like you know, you know, Tony, you bring up an excellent uh, point here. This this is also part of a uh, a lineage of sci-fi slash monster slash whatever uh, disaster mashup park movie. Like this, <laughs> this would play excellently with like Westworld and Jurassic Park. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. The okay. first week, just like, kind of let them let them work it out. It's fine. What is Jurassic Park? Well, while we continue this conversation, so Westworld, that's a science fiction movie, but yeah. it's really a disaster movie. What is Jurassic Park? Is Jurassic Park is a, is, a monster, is a monster movie that's also a disaster movie, which is kind of yeah. how I classify this one. Yeah. I feel so much better that we've had this conversation now because now <laughs> I know how to classify Jaws 3. Honestly, it, it, it is. It is a monster disaster film. Monsaster Monster film? film? It truly has got to be a mashup we can make. Like a, a term. I think misaster would be the oh, would be the word. A monster film. I think I I like this monster film. We'll put this to the vote on the podcast. What what would you what mashup name would you? I'm I'm sticking with this monster movie because also it's this monster movie. Hey, you seen this monster movie? Which one? This one. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's cute. So I dumb. like this monster. This monster anyway. actually that's that's actually pretty great. This monster. <laughs> anyway, uh, there's I think there's their vote for the week. You gotta say you say monsaster because that sounds like Monsanto a little Mon-saster bit. Monsaster does they, indeed. That could be a monsaster no. too. In real life. Should be a, all I know is there should be a movie called Monsaster. <laughs> mm. All right. So With the credit. The the well, because what there aren't a lot of people to waste in this movie about a monster mom. That's a momsaster movie. <laughs> <laughs> just keeps going. It just keeps giving. Anyway, totally... we should get back to Jaws because it's <laughs> it's the it's uh, the okay. monster movie we are what we are talking about at this point. Leah Michelle gets her thigh bitten. Not Leah Michelle. Leah Leah oh, Thompson. I'm so sorry. Leah, Leah Michelle from Glee. Ah. <laughs> How dare you do that to the star of T- Howard the Duck? Totally right. different movie. Leia Thompson. They should remake this. With Leia yeah, well, Michelle. see if it's a if they make it a musical, then it'll be Leia Michelle as the 
that's what it <laughs> means. Yep. The music. So Leah Thompson does get get bitten uh, when when the shark is loose. And by the way, if you're John Putch, if you're if you're the younger brother, how did that not take uh, her leg off? By the way, it's as big as oh, I love the shark cut, in this movie the because it's absurd. But that shark would swallow her whole. Yeah, and and yet doesn't. It just manages to slash her and she gets away. Is that the mama or the baby? Because the mama does swallow the that mama. one guy whole. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Whereas the mama that later whole. swallows Simon McCarkindale. Completely whole and crushes. And I really thought out. he was. I really thought he was going to get out, like a la Geppetto, you know. But no, it yeah. didn't happen. Yeah, and you're serious, right? I mean, you you're not kidding. You you really. I had the same feeling that that somehow or another he was going to be alive and carved yeah, because he is alive shirt. for part of it. So I thought all yeah, they needed to figure awful, out how to pry open his jaw. It's, a, jaws. it's an ugly, bad death. You get yeah. he, he gets swallowed right. whole and then and then <laughs> crushed inside. Yuck. Yeah. Anyway, there, so there Simon McCorkin. The actual jaws of life go I. Yeah. Oh, oh, so awful. My God. I. I mean, yeah. Nobody wants to get masticated by a giant shark. Anyway, um, but it'll come in handy because they've they've spent a lot of uh, a lot of time setting up the fact that that um, these special homemade hand grenades exist that uh, that Simon McCorkendale has made and. Earlier, Dennis Quaid said, you know, no grenades in my park. And and this was the same macho bullshit that we saw in Revenge of the Creature. You know, these two guys are, are kind of facing off against one another. And kind of the subtext is that they're fighting for the attention of Bess Armstrong. Uh, and anyway, that sets up the fact that these that these grenades exist. So later when Simon McCorkendale gets swallowed whole by the shark, he's still got a uh, grenade in his hand. I think and that's a good policy, that, though. Unless your park is Battle Royal, like, no grenades in the park's probably pretty good. Like, I can stick you by this. think. Yeah, and, you know, uh, but, Dennis hey, Quaid has I'm a point. Wrong because However, I actually if you have a 35-foot-long great white shark, all bets are off. Yeah, that seems to be the true. case, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. The, um, I, I just, so when we get down to the end, I know we'll go back to, to there are two interesting window scenes, but I want to get down to how the end resolves which is that uh, finally Dennis Quaid and Bess Armstrong are left to fend off the shark while they, while they you know, drive the people out of the tunnels. And, uh, oh, yeah, they're fighting the shark because the shark comes into the control room. Okay, this is where we should talk, talk about that window scene. Because they're in the control room, the tunnels are being evacuated, they look up at the window, and coming towards them is, I don't even know how to describe it. It's not an effect that works very well. No, it could it worked, that was one of the ones talking about that would have worked a lot better in 3D, because it looks <laughs> so dumb. It actually started laughing out loud, it was so funny. I was delighted by it. It is the shark. It is coming towards them, directly towards the window of the uh, the what we want to may as well call the bridge of the, you know of the underwater. The bridge is literally underwater. This is the control room for all the underwater tunnels. And the shark comes towards them, and it hits the glass, and all the glass shatters and comes towards us. It is a you know it's a composite image. This is not the mechanical shark or any other kind of shark, you know, running through the water. This is a this is a an image of the shark that is being slowly zoomed bigger towards the the glass that is that is at the forefront of the image, and then when it hits, little bits of glass fly around. Uh, all of the stuff that is being presented, all of these composite images have this these weird effects on them that I guess was supposed to make the 3D work pretty well. I don't know, but it causes this weird flickery effect that just looks very strange. And yeah, it's silly. Um, but, you know, I agree. It made Julia laugh. It, it made me laugh. It, it compl- I don't know if anything takes you out of it. It's just it is what it is. You know, well, it, I think it, it's so. hard. I mean, A, the tech was what it yeah. was. We didn't, you know, this is not Avatar. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So the tech was what it was at the time. It was kind of revival. If I'm not mistaken, this is still red blue right like we yeah i think you had the uh i think you had the oh, polarized wait, we had polarized ones that's right um yeah and then you know it's even today when i and part of it's just me having to watch for this kind of stuff but even i'll notice like i'll go to see a uh, 3d movie in 2d and sometimes the lighting which probably works pretty well in 3d doesn't yeah. really work in 2d once it's all smashed down and so yeah. you know you're seeing eight they were trying for the budget in 83 to do everything they could, but 
I I don't know if you're ever gonna it probably looked kind of neat and interesting in 3D, but there's no way when it gets smashed down that it's gonna really yeah. work all that well. But I mean, you could say the same about any of the like, you know, Space Hunter or Destruction oh, of yeah. Jared Thin or um, oh, what was it? The well, Amityville 3D had much the same issues. Although I like, um, I actually think that uh, Friday the Thirteenth 3 still holds up pretty well. It just Friday has the Thirteenth like, 3D is the best, the best one of this glut of yeah of least 3D horror films for sure. Yeah, and it, I mean, they have a lot of like, oh, we're poking stuff at the screen, but like overall i think it still looks yeah. pretty cool um this was not that <laughs> what probably works best is uh to me the, the stuff where they're just sort of floating around among the coral because coral naturally just creates all these like layers right you know where you've got you know a little here and a little there and it's going back that all looks wonderful even in 2d so it probably looked amazing in 3d um, and those are tricks that, you know, worked as far back as, you know, your Viewmaster reels <laughs> in the 50s. It's just, just create layers, and that'll, and that'll work. Um, yeah, anyway, the shark comes into the bridge, and so uh, while it eats one person, uh, Dennis Quaid bravely realizes that inside the mouth of the shark is Simon McCorkendale still holding, I guess he has a death grip on the uh <laughs> well, there, that actually wasn't intended to be a pun. There isn't another word for this. It's a death grip. He's he's got the he's got the the rigor grip on on the uh, grenade, and so Dennis Quaid pulls pulls the pin using a quickly fashioned pin pulling device. That he, <laughs> and, and I love that that they actually make a tool, and then he he does that, and it, and it blows up the um, the shark in a nice big boom kind of explosion under the water where. You know, just clouds of and red. We, we literally oh. see Jaws in 3D. Oh, right. yeah. And the jump jaw. is fine and, like, all the bits and the, and the actual Jaws. By the way, it's Jaws 3D, everybody, in case you didn't notice that. <laughs> You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It is literally the Jaws. Oh, my God. In 3D, Jason. Yeah. Like, they at one point, they may have been 2D, but in that, they came at you. And the actual Jaws were 3D. Can yeah. you believe it? It's almost <laughs> like they should make a movie about that. Yeah, almost. that's pretty amazing. That yeah, that 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 is clearly a joke. I can't think of anything else. It's clearly a bit of humor. It's a bit of relief humor. That's uh, you know just being funny. I loved it. Someone in Hollywood uh, going, okay. It's called Jaws 3D. Like you have to like if we do nothing else. The Jaws must fly at them. I mean, why are we even making this movie? The Jaws must <laughs> come at them in 3D. Why even? It's Jaws 3D. Why don't you understand? Okay, man, we'll 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 do that. Like they have to come at the screen. Don't you understand? <laughs> Jaws. I I almost guarantee you that probably happened. I love your vision of the artist being. You know, there there, there is another artist, moment. No, that's the actually, producer like who's that. like, yeah. And then the yeah, you're you. You get paid. I mean, also, it could have been like, you're right. Like, on the flip side of that, is like, oh man, check this out. We're going to make the Jaws come out 3D. It's going to be really funny. I mean, we're making this crazy movie. But I also, having worked on enough projects um, and am cynical enough to know that probably, you know, it's like the guy who's in the uh, Superman. Um, what's the name of the, the documentary about the making of the, the failed Superman yep, movie, right. uh, Death of Superman. And that guy is notoriously terrible like that, which is why we have a spider, the spider mech thing in Wild Wild West. Very good point. Kept making, you know, and there's such a thin line. What, 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 this, what, what's the line in Spinal Tap? It was something like there's such a thin line between inspired and stupid. Where, because sometimes <laughs> I ride right, that line all the idea. time, let me tell you. Like, <laughs> I've made many a thing that's like, mm, mm. but yeah, but more usually it's just somebody who's like really one of the money people who really has yeah. an ego making the worst decision because they have it in their head or their kid told them what's cool that week. Yeah. Like, okay, everybody, um, I know that we're making the new Halloween, but what if Michael Myers, um, takes a fidget spinner and you know that's the thing so we get a guy and he's got like fidget spinners all stuck in him like that you you're in the art department you can make that happen right and halloween new one it's a thing and then you're like yes. going oh, well it's God. like i posted on the on the facebook about the you know if you ever think you have a dumb idea 
just remember that somebody sat in a room and said, what if we make a movie with a tornado full of sharks? Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so there are no stupid ideas in Hollywood. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, well, yeah, it's, they it's, made five. They've made five of those. And yet they haven't made a contact with us about Lava Shark. And that's. I think you're just going to have to write. Fire Shark? I thought it was Fire Shark. You're going to have to write the script on spec and then just start, you know, like leaking it out there is is really how that's that's probably going to work. I mean, again, Uh, that that goes back to my brother, if I recall. Really like. But but I would you know I think it was Peters who who the thing was he wanted Sp- Superman to fight a giant spider because he really wanted to see a giant spider and a mechanical so spider. he was sort of throwing it and and this is this is one definite thing that makes an idea more stupid than inspired you know is that if you're if the idea is just some reason strangely fetishistic for you that can often be pretty stupid if it doesn't fit what's going on if you have an idea though honestly that is based on the work that you're working on and it just happens to be really sort of extreme and out there my tendency is to think go for it because a lot of times people will just not be able to believe they're seeing this and it'll be really memorable you know, and Stephen King does stuff like this all the time. You can get so much mileage out of, like, the fact that the, the can opener will suddenly start rattling and dancing or something. And, and you know, you'll – you'll I actually I remember there was one where, for some reason, some of those chattering – you know, the, the chattering joke teeth that you buy at a, at a joke shop and you wind mm-hmm. them up and you go – he did one of those. Yeah, that's that movie called, like, what is it, Overdrive or something like that? It may well have happened in Maximum Overdrive. Yeah, Maximum Overdrive. I think it's in – you know, there was there was a story I wrote, I read by Stephen King, where you know those little teeth um, start chasing somebody around and biting them, and it's so crazy and silly. And to me, that works great. I love ideas that are that absurd. Um, it's it, but you know, occasionally somehow you do it wrong, you come up with it wrong, and you veer over the line into stupid. Nobody's interested in. in well, I think it's sincerity. Well, like if you yeah. sincerely go, this is so crazy, I cannot wait. Um, yeah. And that's a lot of that, as opposed yeah. to like, so I've got this idea I keep hearing about, you know. <laughs> and here this, this yeah. Cool hats, and it usually happens at the money end. And it's never good, and it's never sincere, and it shows every time. Well, I think it's fair to say that was the truth, definitely, with the Joker playing a lot of uh, Prince music. I, I, you know, I think there's no other way around it. There's no way to watch the Joker running around playing Prince music and not go, this is here because somebody made a deal to <laughs> put Prince music into this movie. Some people really uh, are in, like that, and I think that's really inspired. I yeah. go back and forth on it, but... Anyway, it was I, I like the I like the Prince music in the in the uh, art art museum scene. I'm not oh, gonna cool. lie, like it fits it fits the scene well. There are definitely times in the first Batman where the Prince music feels a little feels a little intrusive. That's the only scene I can remember that's like that. Uh, but okay, so it worked for you. There you go. I mean, that, that's a that's a really really good example of an idea that is either inspired or stupid, depending on on who's uh, on who's watching it. Uh, you know, to some extent, putting this Jaws movie into SeaWorld, that probably, the whole thing was basically inspired or stupid. Did it actually have to be SeaWorld? My only thing that I don't like about that, like, I like that it's in a water park. I wish they actually had not called it SeaWorld because it feels like product, product placement. And also oh, now like... in 2017, <laughs> 2017, with uh, all the baggage that the name SeaWorld now has, it's hard for me yeah. not to watch watch it with that context there and kind of root for the shark to eat all the people that work at SeaWorld. <laughs> I also am always intrigued when people put product placement in something that's like, okay, so everything at SeaWorld in this SeaWorld is dangerous right. and it goes wrong. <laughs> Don't you want to get... Hey, let's get people to come out to Dangerland. That, I was <laughs> thinking about that. You know, Dennis Quaid's a it's brilliant nice. guy in this movie. Mm-hmm. Bess Armstrong is a genius. But Academy Award winning actor Louis Gossett Jr. is a maniac. And there's no way that SeaWorld <laughs> would I want him. I always wonder. <laughs> yeah, it's always funny to me. It's like when you name a company, somebody, some people name a company like some self-fulfilling prophecy. Like, 
Titanic games. You're like, no, man, don't. Or that, or that car that was called Nova, but in Spanish that means it doesn't go. Nova. Right. Yeah, that was no. a mistake. Yeah. But what I'm saying is people <laughs> calls it like impending explosion, implosion yeah, right, game right, right. Yes. or whatever. You're like, oh, come on. Don't. Yeah. Oh, don't. Don't self-fulfilling prophecy yourself. Like, think just a little bit. Like, even if you think that's kind of funny or like endearing <laughs> at the time, don't do that. Don't tempt fate that way. Totally no, gonna really fail. Record label. <laughs> like, ah, uh-uh. Yeah. No, don't, don't do that, please. People do it all the time. That was a really excellent point. Yeah, <laughs> I cannot believe. I but uh, Joya's point because I said something similar to that. It's like I can't believe that Sea World would want to show itself in a movie where the people who work there completely put all the people's lives at risk. And she's like, hey, it's, it's publicity. You know? there's, no, there's no such thing as bad publicity. I guess that's the theory. And, you know, yeah, because they nearly freaking drown these people in that underwater tunnel. That's nuts. I, by the way, is this a real thing? I'm not trying to be stupid, but is there such a real thing where you have a bunch of tunnels, you wander around underneath and look at and Probably. Like sea mammals and fish. I mean, they have those ones that, like, you know, like the, um, what's that place in Grapevine that's the aquarium? The, uh, I forget what it's called. But anyway, they have that, you know, like a, you walk through. There's a lot of places like that in aquariums where you walk through a tunnel, but it's just a small, it's a right. tank. It's not, you're not under the, under the ocean. Is, but, you know, there's the thing, there's the, like. network of tunnels 40 yeah. feet below the water. I know, but there's also, you know, there's, I mean, I think there is probably some stuff like that. Cause I've seen a lot of. <clears throat> different things that look like that. The other the other thing, by the way, that I would point out that, that makes this less a horror movie than more something else is the use of stuff like they go down in a submersible, which is this really cool two-man car that, you know, it, it, it's not a submarine. It's, a, you know, it fills yeah, with water. Yeah, they still have to use, yeah, they still have to use But I mean, gear. what a, what a neat piece of technology just to randomly show off. You know, in your monster movie. Wait, that's wait. Like, you think this is somehow not a horror movie because there is a submersible in it? <laughs> There's a severed 3D arm, Jason! A severed 3D arm! Silly. Yeah, I'm with you. All right, we should wrap James up. I don't understand why you don't lot. want this to be a horror movie. It's like you, 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 for some reason, like you just don't want that for this movie. To me, horror movies, and, and I know, look, we've been, we've done like nearly 275 episodes, so it's hard to say. You'd think I would be better able to define horror movies, but you know, to me, horror movies are many things, but almost nothing here qualifies it as a horror movie. There's nothing. There's not a. I have not a single moment of dread in this film. None. Well, that's because it's no. badly staged. But there's a <laughs> scene where a guy gets chewed up by a giant shark. True indeed. Grizzly. Yeah, no, it's grizzly. You know, yeah. it, the oh, only yeah. thing that's it's it's just badly executed. But there is definitely stuff that was in this movie where the intention. The trailer. For this movie, which is excellent. I love, I, I unapologetic for as many problems as I have with this movie, I unapologetically love the trailer for this movie. I think it's one of the best movie trailers of all time. Um, it says, Terror is the third dimension. They were intending to scare people. Yeah. Whether or not they actually achieve that is, you know, debatable. But that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, I get it. If your intention is to frighten me or a horror film, it's an utter failure as a horror film. I hate to say that, but I think that's true. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, I may as well take the first closing since I already said that. That sounds like a thesis statement. So let me give my closing thought, and then we'll go whichever order we 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 did earlier. But. Utter failure as a horror movie. Nevertheless, I loved this movie. I could watch it again. It's uh, it. I I really enjoyed it as, uh, you know, an adventure film. And I would have loved to have read a bunch of really brisk novels about Dennis Quaid and and um, Bess Armstrong and you know whatever wacky stuff was happening at at uh, this imaginary sea world uh, over and over again. So that's that's what I'm thinking there. <clears throat> uh, okay, who was next? Was it Tony next? I think it was. Tony, what are your thoughts? Um, possibly. Um, I like the disaster movie and horror elements of this. Although, as a side note, it did sound like Drew was trying to pitch Grizzly Shark, which is a good <laughs> <laughs> to prove in some shape, form, or fashion. But uh, 
No, it's fun. It's uh, it's harder. It's very, very, very 1983. Uh, warts and all. Um, fashions certainly. Like absolutely. Fashions the just the kind of when there's a kind of a romp nature to things it has a very 80s way of um just in its approach uh i wish i do one day need to see it in 3d just because i i'm super curious because it was always on cable in the summer and i actually usually caught that in shot i mostly caught the tail end of jaws 3 like a bunch a bunch of times um is it gonna be in my rotation for horror movies that i just watch constantly probably not but it's it's a fun movie it's better than a lot of other sequels uh to you know other you know maybe not well the problem is also that jaws one is just such a great movie altogether that by the time you get to this Jaws three, you know, it's things you can't touch that. So they had to just go off the rails in the way that they did, and we got a, at least a fun movie out of this off the rails thing. So it's excellent, fun. excellent. Uh, Julia, what are your final thoughts? So whenever I hear somebody say something like, you know, Jaws one was such a great movie altogether, in my head I go back to Airplane, and like everybody says, Jaws one was such a great movie. <laughs> I like one day that will happen and it will make me so happy. <laughs> but anyway, so far, so far it's just me. I'm the only one who goes back to airplane. Um, this movie had such great nostalgia factors for me. Like I just loved, I just felt like I was, you know, a kid again and, and the, watching all the creepy stuff come at me. And I, I felt, like I said, I felt sad that there wasn't, that we missed so many years of 3D. Cause I, love, I like going to 3, 3D movies. Very seldom do they do the, the schlocky pop out, you know, like the harp, oh, with one we didn't mention the harpoon that shoots right out at you in, yeah. the, in the film. That was scary as hell in 3D. And that's the thing. It's like nowadays we really don't use 3D for that the jump scares. We just use it to like make things look more like more like virtual reality. And I, and I guess that's where we're going with it. Is that everything will become virtual reality eventually, probably. But um, but anyway, it's, it's I think it's a lot of fun to have those to have those jump scares. This movie has a lot of flaws. It's dumb in a lot of ways. But the and the shark is is scary at times, and other times it's just so stupid looking, especially when they're oh. trying to just use the 3D thing of it floating in front of you and it's not actually doing anything. What were you yeah, going to say, Tony? I to ask you. Um, sorry, like, the dolphin at the end. <laughs> Did that work at all in 3D? Yeah, it's added, awesome. I love having the dolphin jump out so at you. <laughs> that so was terrible. great. It's... No, but it was so fun. I well, love and, how and plus it's just a great... Together. The two dolphins, one on either end of the, of the screen, spin in unison oh. and they're these wonderful composite dolphins. That yeah, and, they look like Mortal Kombat to me. And it's like, very it's like, fight. <laughs> <laughs> it's very conflicting to see that because I mean, obviously they're being held captive and they're being treated. But I think I'm hoping that they're treated okay. But I, I really hate to see. I actually don't like going to zoos or circuses or anything because I hate to see animals in captivity. But um, but you know, but gosh, it sure is entertaining. That's for sure. Uh, and then the Shamu whale, of course, which is what Tony was, or I can't remember if it was Tony or Drew was talking about, I think Drew maybe, talking about what a bad rap uh, SeaWorld has gotten since then because of, like, Shamu and all the other. But, um, but you know, it's fun to uh, to watch. I mean, for sure, that's why people pay the money to go. Um, so, you know, I think it's it, there's definitely some entertainment value to this movie and uh, and some fun effects and, you know, not bad acting, which is, a lot more than I could say for a lot of films we've watched. Um, so, you know, I give it probably, I'd give it more than the three, three and a half stars or whatever that, that it seems to get online. I'd probably give it like six stars maybe out of ten. Anyway, um, so it's, you know, it's not bad. Uh, it's definitely fun. But yes, if we can watch it in 3D, if it's ever playing in just uh, some old theater that they're willing to do oh, it in 3D, that. that'd be super fun. Absolutely. <clears throat> Drew. This has been a really fun conversation. I mean, what are your final thoughts about about Jaws 3? Um, I, I don't think that my opinion has changed much through this conversation, although I have enjoyed discussing this movie. Um, I think this is a fun movie if you like genre movie of this type from this particular time period. If you are just, you know, a random person that, that has no interest, although why would you be listening to this podcast? <laughs> um, and no interest in monster movies or horror movies or science fiction movies or whatever, you yeah. know, you're probably not going to get anything out of this because it's, it's, it is a schlocky, schlocky movie. And, you know, that's, I, I do, 
I enjoy watching this movie. Like I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm coming across like I hate this movie. I don't. I think it's entertaining. Again, for some reason, it's a movie I have seen many, many times. <laughs> Um, you know, I never really hate myself for watching it, but I don't think it's a good, I'd probably give it like two and a half stars if I were in the business of giving. So, or it would be like a C, it would be like a C plus if we were grading this. Like it, it's definitely not the worst thing going, but it's, it's hokey. It's really hokey. Excellent. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, Okay, we, I, I have nothing else to add because I, I, I went first. But uh, this has been, I have to say, it's been really, really fun to discuss. We should do our endorsements. I'm dying to know what else you guys have been watching or listening to or want to share about this week. Tony, we should come back around to you. Um, what, are your, what, what do you have to endorse for us this time? Um, I don't know. I, I've been pretty busy, and this week has been pretty terrible um, on a national level. So I endorse this week, uh, you know, hanging out with your friends, doing something extremely entertaining, um, lighthearted, uh, you know, create some art. I spent part of the time in the studio, and that was a welcome uh, change from just staring at my phone and being sad about the news. Uh, create something cool or buy something from somebody creating something cool, something that's uplifting, um, that doesn't hurt your fellow humans um, or treat them like crap. Uh, yeah, just be excellent to one another, to quote a really fun movie. Like, be good. Like it's not that hard. Um, and that's what I endorse most of all. Like watch something entertaining and have fun. Um, I, you know, unfortunately I saw Dunkirk, which is really amazing, but maybe this wasn't the weekend I probably should have seen that because I came back and all it's a heavy movie and it's really beautiful in 70 millimeter. But uh yeah, so I I say watch some things that are super fun, whatever that is for you. Um, as long as you're not hurting yourself or others, go for it. Julia, what about you? Do you have anything for us uh, to endorse this week? Um, not really. I um, I have to go a step further than, than Tony in light of, of what happened in Charlottesville and, and what's been going on and say, um, yeah, sure, absolutely be loving toward each other and, and create art and whatever. That's all good. But also stand up. Stand up for what you believe in and for what for what's right, and speak out because um, you know I found, I'm pulling up a quote from Martin Luther King that says, "White Americans must recognize that justice for Black people cannot be achieved without radical changes in the structure of our society. The comfortable entrenched the privilege cannot continue to tremble at the prospect of change of the status quo." And then there's um, a few other ones to talk about how basically silence is is worse than than speak than speaking hatred because at least the speaking hatred is is evident. Um, and so. I would definitely say that uh, that we people who have have the privilege and who don't have people trying to kill us because of the color of our skin need to speak out to other people and say this is wrong. You know, you shouldn't treat people this way, and and we need to uh, to be more comfortable with the idea that yeah, we may not always um, have everything we want, but it's not the fault of people of color. It's not it's not anybody else's fault, but the fault. If we want to blame anybody, blame the you know the people who are taking all the money, not the people who are suffering. But anyway, so that's been yeah, I've, it's been on heavy on my heart as well, and um, I certainly uh, I certainly feel like we should be more. I, I would like to be more active than I even am, and I've pretty much devoted my whole career to the the underprivileged. So I um you know that's just passion for me. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Drew. What about you? Well, um, I don't have anything to add on on that end. I think they both, you know, said everything I would have said on that. So I will go a little less cerebral and thought provoking. Uh, although I will ask a question. This is less an endorsement and more uh, a statement of how masochistic I am. I have been watching the Sci-Fi Channel original TV series Van Helsing. Uh, I don't think it is good. I I I, will, I have to stress that I think it is poorly done, and yet I can't stop watching it. I, <laughs> as you might gather from the title, uh, it is a vampire series. However, I am five episodes in, and thus far. Uh, despite the fact that it is called Ben Helsing, I cannot tell what the hell this has to do with Dracula. Uh, it is a post-apocalyptic series. It has more in common with uh, 
I am legend than Dracula. Uh, these, these characters are existing in a world where vampires have taken over, and the vampires are very poorly made up. They look like people with jaundice. <laughs> um, there is the only Dracula tie in the episodes I've seen so far is that the main character is named Vanessa Seward. Get it? And uh, the only thing that would even remotely pass as clever is that for some reason this woman is inexplicably woken up from a, from a coma as a sort of reverse vampire, and when she bites vampires, they turn back into people, which is, uh, again, treading that line between being stupid and inspired, uh, which... Again, I, I, I guess I'm just a masochist because I want to find out what the hell this show has to do with Dracula. I don't know that I can quite say that it is good, but it has definitely kept my mind off of all the uh, terrible things going on in the world. Whether or not that is an endorsement, I don't know. But it is what I've been watching this week. You know, I hope, honestly, I hope it does well. I, even if there's a vampire series out there that I'm not interested in, you know, it, I always hope they do well because the last thing we need is vampire uh, products that do poorly because it always causes people to go, ah, there will never be another vampire again. So, you know, Godspeed Van Helsing, even though I'm not at all interested in watching that. that I have no idea why it's called Van Helsing. Like, like, I really don't. Like, I, I, I keep expecting... Wikipedia thinks like, that the main character is named Vanessa Van Helsing, but... No, she's you know. not. Her name is Van, Vanessa Seward, unless there's a twist that's coming up. But thus far... As but anyway, it did get renewed for a second. Dracula. So good for them. There will be more. There will be yet more that's coming soon. So, uh, so good for them. Uh, okay. Uh, my endorsement actually is this really interesting uh, independent film called Dave Made a Maze by uh, a director named Bill Watterson. No, uh, no uh, relation to, I don't think. I, anyway, not the same Bill Watterson who makes Calvin and Hobbes. But Dave Made a Maze is about this guy who, it's, it's a very strange, almost Wes Anderson-like comedy where this guy builds a fort in his living room out of cardboard boxes. And then his girlfriend comes home from a weekend trip and she hears his voice and he says, oh, well, I'm, I'm stuck inside this maze. And she realizes that the maze inside the maze of boxes is vastly bigger than outside. And as they go in, it's this amazing vision of this world built of cardboard that he made. It just gets bigger and bigger, and it's, and it's very strange, and it has a lot of really quirky comedy. And um, you should check out the trailer for this and and check it out. It's it's brand new uh, on video, and, and um, I, I absolutely recommend it. It's very strange. I mean, uh, just neat, goofy, uh, and, and visionary. You know, it reminds me of, like, Actually, there was a very similar episode on Community where, if you recall this, they started a, a I think it was a, a like a paintball competition, and they wound up having a maze made of cardboard that, that stretched endlessly, endlessly, endlessly. It's like that. So um, that's my endorsement. Dave made a maze. Uh, and that's it. So I, I, I agree with everything that everybody said about be excellent to each other, but that never ceases to be more true. And I guess Julia's point that we also should speak up, and, and if you have the privilege to do so, that you should. So I'll, I'll do my best to do that this week. Um, thanks, everyone. I cannot wait to discuss whatever it is we're going to discuss next. I don't well, even we should, remember. We should I actually don't. plug Anime Fest. Yes. Oh, yeah. That is okay. next week. This week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in fact, that's what we're going to do next, because on Saturday night we're going to record our next episode live. Drew, uh, thank you for reminding me. Why don't you tell tell them what we're going to be recording? We are going to be returning to Anime Fest, and we will be recording Wicked City, the anime classic. Uh, and it should be fun. We had a great time doing Vampire Hunter D last year. We made a lot of friends. Uh, it'll be good to uh, get back and to, uh, you know, say hello, see if any of those people come back and it's just going to be a good time. I'll be in the Sheridan at Dallas, and I hope uh, hope all y'all come out and, and say hello. If any of you. I won't Dallas miss it because my kiddos will be back in school, but you guys will do great without me, and I will miss you. We will and, miss you. Yeah, we will miss Julia. Jamie will be there in her in her place. 
if that's the appropriate way to say that. Not that Julie can be replaced. It's not that Julie can be replaced. It's not. That's not, not how it works. Not that I. Not that I stand. Uh, not that I can uh, can compare with Jamie either. So she's she will do great. Oh, you both you both have have excellent excellent qualities and 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 both <laughs> add your own add your own different spice when you're on the on the on the podcast. So. But uh, I am I am greatly looking forward to Anime Fest. I think that, that you know this is this is something I've been looking forward to all summer, and I'm glad we were able to work with the people who put it on to uh, appear again. We're also going to be doing a lot of panels, so go to the Anime Fest website and look at the panels and see which panels we're going to be on, and come by and say hi, and actually see what we look like in person and in the most non stalkery way. And hopefully you haven't been taking Jason's <laughs> advice about the podcast too literally and you're like, I'm gonna kidnap the Castle of Horror people and tie them up and force them to listen to their own podcast. Why would you put that out there? Again, why am I the only sane individual if there's none of this should be out there? But have we not I seen said, all of this in I said, don't do that. I said, don't do that. I understand. You've seen the movies we cover. You can't just put it out there and say no. Oh, man. But again, please don't. <laughs> you know what? Just for you, Tony, this time. No, no, I'm no, going no. no. To... It's not like, hey, da dum, ba ba. Good, good night, everybody. <laughs> say good night, Jason. <laughs> Yes. All right, leave reviews. It really makes a big difference. <laughs> bye bye, everybody. We look forward to talking to you on oh, the Facebook right. page. But but do uh, bro, do do we will we do need to start the poll as a reminder. It what your combo name for disaster monster movie is? <laughs> yes, yes. Mom, I vote for Mom's disaster. All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Have a wonderful evening. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye.